Hello, my name is Ed Hope, a junior doctor in the UK, and this is our look at episode five of This Is Gonna Hurt, the BBC medical TV drama based on the book by Adam Kay. And boy, does it live up to its name. Just to remind you, it's set on a labor ward, so we're gonna see operations, babies being born, and scenes some may find distressing. So let's check it out. I um, clearly should have been more specific. Could you please get me a urine sample? Oh, shit. Oh. What the frick? Another thing to file under things that didn't happen. I think there is enough drama in our jobs to not go as so low as to have a dude mistakenly give a sperm sample, then not put the lid on tight enough, and then spill it all over his mobile phone. One of the first clinics I worked on when I was on Obzangani was the fertility clinic, and we would routinely require a sperm sample as fertility problems between men and women are pretty close to 50-50, despite this clinic being under the gynecologist. Oh. Yeah, black's pornography, I'm afraid. I wasn't looking up pornography. The political crack has gone mad. I'm trying to pull out some past papers, but it's blocked the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology website. Yes, a very real issue. In many ways, it's understandable that a large organisation like the NHS blocks a lot of stuff on the internet, but... Equally, sometimes you need to look up fairly dodgy sounding search terms when doing your research, particularly on Obs and Gynae. Still working here then? I guess so. Knew yeah, you would. So you're just gonna not let it get to you? Put up the old shields? Stiff up a labia, right? Oh my God, stiff upper labia. I'm much more comfortable sticking with the stiff upper lip phrase. And we saw a bit of this attitude in the last episode too don't let it get to you, basically putting the responsibility of a bad working environment onto you. So instead of dealing with the issues of why Dr. Shruti is clearly burnt out and reaching crisis point, she should just not let it get to her or even maybe she isn't cut out for the job like we heard in the last episode. Do we not want a good environment for healthcare staff and for staff to feel empathetic and able to do the job they're proud of? Or do we want people that can just turn a blind eye to the issues. That may work for some people in the short term, but in the long run, are you really gonna get the best staff and the best care that way? Hi, I'm Adam, I'm one of the doctors here. Am I right in thinking you've had some bleeding and it's um, not like a period? Has it happened before? It's like being a fucking vet. Um... Come on, man. I just wanna reassure anyone watching that this is a freaking terrible, consultation. There's absolutely nothing wrong with how he starts quite lively and friendly, but he should have picked up fairly quickly that there's something distressing the patient. At this point, I'd be worried about what the cause of the bleeding was. Is it self-harm or sexual assault, or is there a particular diagnosis that the patient is worried about? And so he has to be flexible with the way he communicates. It's not about the patient fitting into your communication style. Do you mind if I have a quick look? I'll get a, a nurse to join us. Can I get a chaperone in here for a second? So I wouldn't necessarily be examining just yet until I had a bit more of an idea of what was going on. But one good thing, there is a chaperone here. So any intimate examination, there should be a chaperone in the room. And that's not just to protect the patients, but also to protect healthcare staff if a patient accuses you of abuse or assault. Was it an accident I or what? I didn't know it bleed so much. Just when you think you've seen everything, someone gives their vulva a short back and sides. Wow, another really difficult case, but one that is entirely realistic. We found out the patient has had some trauma to their vulva, so the outer part of her genitals, and that's the reason for her bleeding. Despite what the patient has said, you would still need to keep the idea of her being a victim of assault in the back of your mind. I'm guessing she is telling the truth. Self-harm of the genitals is something I've seen quite a few times before. And there is also the possibility of accidental injury. So she's had body image concerns and she's not quite realized how much she has damaged herself. Either way, Dr. Adam ends the consultation well. So he ends up figuring out what's going on. The patient is distressed and, and you know changes his tone and ends up doing a good job. So it's right to acknowledge to the patient that we will help with what's going on and they are in a safe place to discuss anything. But first we need to make sure we stop anything that may harm them. 
So in this case that we'd need to stop the bleeding, we need to get IV access and check for any blood loss and get her blood type in case we need to give her a blood transfusion and keep her closely monitored. Personally, before I leave, get a set of observations myself, particularly looking at the heart rate and blood pressure, just to make sure the patient isn't showing any signs of hemorrhagic shock. I may have written in the notes that my consultant um, told me to send the patient home when he didn't. There was an internal hospital complaint, which I uh, slightly lent on the patient to drop. I see. Wow, this is exactly what we said in the last episode. The actual mistake itself is now less of an issue, but it's the way he's managed it since. Firstly, amending the notes, and secondly, putting pressure on the patient to drop it. That shows serious integrity issues. And we hear the tone of the operator from the MDU here changing to reflect that. These medical professional indemnity companies absolutely exist, and for this reason. <laughs> I drank a jug of water overnight like they told me to. Do you mind if I have a gentle feel of your tummy? Oh, I thought you'd never ask. <clears throat> God, what's wrong with this prick? Oh my God, man. Dr. Adam, he's completely lost it. I feel for the guy. You just hope that people get help before they get to this point. It's freaking sad because if you'd have met someone like Dr. Adam at medical school interviews, everyone is so optimistic and bright and positive and friendly, and it's a cliche, but they all want to help people. And somewhere along the line, you get this beaten out of you until you are someone that is the complete opposite to this and ends up directly damaging your beliefs of who you are. It's you know, a type of moral injury. Although, can I just say, the patient's partner here acting like the hospital is a playground we do get this. I guess we see it a lot in A&E. It is pretty annoying and very disrespectful, but probably a friendly reminder of where he is. It's probably the best way to deal with this rather than calling the guy a prick. 19 years old, just performed some cosmetic surgery on the vulva. I've got a woman who tried to jump off a bridge this morning. It's just not an emergency. Since when did we only f see life and death emergencies in this place? You losing your shit at me isn't going to magic up any more doctors. Okay, well, this is the sweariest <laughs> referral I've ever seen. We went on to find out that the woman cut her labia as a result of body dysmorphia disorder, and Dr. Adam reassures her that everything to do with her labia was normal. So the help she really needs is to see a mental health expert, particularly now because she's now got stitches in that area. I've been in these exact situations before where you're speaking to a specialty about something that doesn't quite fit within the ordinary and therefore there's some wiggle room for the specialty not to accept seeing the patient. So this conversation here is entirely realistic. I will see her when I get two seconds. Thank you. I owe you. And as we see here, more often than not, you're able to come to a safe compromise that's best for the patient and usually involves a lot less swearing too. Although given the number of patients the doctor has to see, it's gonna be a few hours wait and your worry would be that the patient is gonna self-discharge and not get the immediate help that they'd benefit from. Now, I can't find a heartbeat, which means that your baby is no longer alive. No, I'm afraid it's unmistakable. I can show you the heart on the scanner if you like, but it's not moving. Um, in terms of which option you'd like to go ahead with. Oh, oh my God. Now Dr. Shruti has just completely lost her empathy and self-awareness. She seems completely oblivious to how the patients are feeling in front of her in breaking this bad news. Well, it might be easy not to think of it as a baby. It's just a bunch of cells. A bunch of cells? Oh my. This is absolutely horrendous. One good thing is this show is allowing us to empathize with Shruti because we have seen what she's been going through to get to this point. But the patient doesn't see that. They see someone in a privileged position, that of a doctor who is there to provide a service and is not showing any understanding or, and even being callous towards them. And I can relate to this. I remember the worst would be my medical on calls where we'd do five 12 hour night shifts in a row on your feet all day, not having much to eat, sometimes not going to the toilet. So you'd have all this, you know, your natural empathy and understanding ripped out from under you. And as a patient, I really wouldn't have wanted to see a doctor like me 
at that point. So it might seem easy to judge Shruti in this situation at face value, but what should she do? If she were to leave, she would feel that she's creating even more pressure on those around her that's also struggling. Also ringing in her ears would be the advice from the senior doctors, like challenging her, maybe she's not good enough for the role, which is naturally a barrier for her seeking help. In an ideal world, she would be in a supportive system and never get to this point. But if she did, there must also be a way of guiding her through these difficult patches. What do you mean? What do I mean? Putting in a complaint about me. Before or after, I lose my job. Don't embarrass yourself. I knew you were a terrible doctor. I didn't know that you were a terrible person as well. Jesus Christ, man. That escalated. I guess two things to say about this alcohol, not a good way to deal with these pressures. And although as doctors, we're well aware of the complications of alcohol, we're actually more likely to abuse it. And also formal complaints, I get it. Given what we do, you're bound to have them and they do stay with you long after you've left your shift. Stop it. She didn't do it. Spare me. I did. You're a liability. And what about bullying Erica into dropping her perfectly valid complaint? That was the cherry on the top of the whole cake of shit. Oh, wow. We've actually covered all the layers of this cake of shit throughout these breakdowns. So as much as Dr. Adam can feel hard done by, these do show a catalogue of professional issues and a pattern of bad behaviour. So there you have it, another roller coaster of a show. I mean, I say roller coaster, it's mainly just downhill. Also, the soundtrack in this series so far has been absolutely banging. I mean, this episode ending with Modern Romance by the Yeah Yeah Yeahs, great tune. I hope you enjoyed this breakdown and I'd love to know your thoughts on the episode or your thoughts on my thoughts on the episode. Thank you for watching this far. If you haven't already, please give this video a like and consider subscribing. It helps to tell YouTube that this is good content and also helps to inform me that you want to see more of it. So on that note, I hope you're all well and I'll be back soon.